afternoon all of you and a warm welcome uh, who all are present for today's uh, grant thornton thought leadership series webinar uh, especially you know curated for the social sector space and this is second in its series and we intend to have many more uh, in the coming weeks so as we start uh, you know today's webinar is on uh, cso response in covid 19 situation uh, immediate initiation and future course and uh, I would like to welcome uh, our esteemed panelists uh, who are here. Uh, none of them need uh, you know, a detailed introduction, but I'll take a couple of minutes to introduce each one of uh, them. So to start off, uh, we have Dr. Bulbut Sood, uh, who is the country director of Chapaibo. Uh, she's a public health professional with uh, more than four decades of experience in uh, family planning, maternal and reproductive health. Uh, under her leadership, Japaiko India Country Office was uh, set up in 2009, and now it's one of the leading public health uh, organization in not-for-profit space. Uh, among many uh, hat she wears and responsibilities she spearheads, I just you know name few of them. She's a member of WHO Family Planning Medical uh, Committee. Uh, she's a peer reviewer of CDC Prevention Division of Reproductive Health in Atlanta. Uh, she has been a co-chair of the White Ribbon Alliance for Safe Motherhood for seven years, uh, technical advisory group member of Maternal Health Task Force of Harvard, and uh, Task Force of Ministry of Health and Family Welfare. So welcome, uh, Dr. Sood, for this webinar. Uh, then we have uh, Manoj Kupalakrishna, who is the CEO of Care India. He is a Wharton alumni with over two and a half decades of leadership experience in global as well as Indian organizations. Uh, Manoj has been key contributor uh, to the transformation of Hindustan Latex Limited, after which he joined Bethan Dickinson, uh, which is a Fortune 500 medical technology company, as MD, uh, leading the Southeast Asia operation. Uh, Manoj's last career assignment was with HCL as uh, CEO of the Healthcare Vertical, uh, wherein they pioneered the development of primary ambulatory care centers in Delhi NCR in partnership with John Hopkins. Manoj is also co-founder uh, and chairman of Prozella Healthcare, which is a, a, a medical, which is a professional services enabling medical technology companies for accelerating their growth. And also, he is a management advisor to few health tech startup uh, organizations who are working uh, to solve the healthcare challenges uh, using digital technologies and artificial intelligence. A very warm welcome, Manoj, uh, for this webinar. And of course, we have Mohammed Asif, who is the executive director of Plan India. Uh, with over two decades of development and humanitarian experience. Uh, Asif joined PAN in 2006 and took uh, on a national role as director program implementation in 2009. Uh, in past one year, uh, in past one decade, he has successfully implemented long, uh, you know, uh, of over 500 development projects across the country uh, with an aggregate budget of over 250 million US dollars and which was in partnership with more than 100 grassroots NGOs. Uh, Asif also chairs uh, executive uh, committee of Sphere India for the past few years, and he sits on the board of few not-for-profit organizations. And prior to plan, Asif served with Action Air International and Indian Social Institute. So I welcome uh, all the panelists uh, for this discussion. And as we start deliberating on the topic, uh, I just uh, take a minute to set the you know the objective and the context uh, context behind this uh, session. So we aim to you know collect the opinions of CSO leaders like all of you to help understand the ecosystem uh, and evaluate the steps which each one of you have taken for your organization uh, under the response of COVID-19 and what are the future course of action you all deliberate as it moves. So I think civil society organization came forward to support the marginalized through a series of steps in this pandemic situation. The initiative, you know, panned uh, across uh, contribution for food kits, medical supplies, medical and life support equipment, awareness campaigns, uh, counseling session for uh, mental trauma, among others. So as we uh, move forward for our discussion today, uh, we'll seek uh, our panelists uh, to respond on few of the aspects which we have curated for this session specifically. Uh, and I would like to start with uh, Dr. Sood. Uh, so Dr. Sood, if you can sh share briefly uh, about how Japaiko responded uh, you know, uh, in the COVID situation. 
on the programmatic uh, elements which you know uh, have been your core strength so it'd be good to know uh, and uh, i would appreciate if you can give few case studies uh, which would help us to understand it a little better so please dr sood so thank you very much vikas and uh, good afternoon everyone and uh, i would like to uh, thank uh, 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 vikas for giving us this opportunity to share what uh, cso is doing in the area of uh, covid 19 pandemic uh, just to take you through before i go on what we did uh, uh, a brief uh, introduction of what japaigo japaigo is an affiliate of john hopkins university and as you see our mission is very clear that we believe in saving lives improving health and transforming future and we work in uh, several states in the country and we work with both national government at uh, and also state governments and both in public and private sector but japaigo in india as you said we, the india office was established in 2009 and currently we are working in almost 27 states different point in time and we have been working in the area of family planning maternal and newborn health uh, for the com comprehensive primary health care which you know aishman bharat uh, program which was launched by the honorable prime minister and also in ncd and uh, uh, next so we actually when the this covid uh, came uh, into the horizon and in march 17 we were asked to work from home and we said what do they, because as you know by that time the movement were restricted you were advised not to move out uh, and go to uh, various facilities or travel and other things so we decided that let's see how we can support the frontline health workers with both the knowledge and expertise to deal with this pandemic because this was absolutely new nobody knew what what covid 19 was and what they could do to protect their communities and themselves the second one was to also support the state governments in their request for the uh, covid 19 response and as things were moving on you know the state governments came to us and said could you help us in area a b and c and of course also very important was to ensure that we could continue with the other services like uh, maternal newborn health family planning uh, ncdk you know cancer survey so cancer test or any cancer and so that we said we need to respond to all these things next now in terms of uh, what did we do you know we said there were this cadre of health workers and as you know in uh, if you look at the area of health and wellness center or whether it is district hospital or whether it is your community health centers you have doctors nurses so we actually very quickly said we need to educate everyone and uh, i'm happy to say that within a short period of time we were successful in uh, you know educating uh, people from the different uh, Uh, communities of uh, healthcare workers and almost 44000 uh, workers have been trained in very short period on the covid 19 response and we did all this through using the echo platform zoom technology microsoft you know all those uh, tech, you know basically linking up and training them and all, not just training but lot of mentoring also we started next uh Uh, you can just move on so what were the things we developed quickly we developed the learning resource packages because when we realized that the guidelines were being released by the government you know but you know to convert those guidelines into easy to understand things by different level of healthcare workers so you had somebody like asha who was a community health worker to a doctor who was at the setra shri care and guidelines had to be uh, adapted to their use So we developed the material whether it was whether it was facility preparedness, MNH related care like how to take care of women who were pregnant uh, during labor, after delivery. Uh, you know there were a lot of things about uh, how to continue the other services. Mental health was coming up as a big challenge, and we said okay, we need to develop material, uh, how to do the clinical management. So all these things we very quickly developed. Next. and then ic material because it was very important that we had to also create awareness in the community and it was important to have some simple to understand how to take care of people who were uh, you know 
sick, how to, to do social distancing, how to wash hands, simple things. But you know, they had to be converted into something visually which could appeal to the uh, general public and they could understand do's and don'ts, uh, also especially related to the healthcare providers, uh, standard operating procedures for pregnant and breastfeeding women, because there were a lot of worry whether, you know, women who uh, uh, should be breastfeeding or not breastfeeding and then, you know, justification why and all those things. Next. Uh, and we were also very sure that we had to ensure that continuation of the essential services should be maintained. So as I said, regarding women who were pregnant during delivery, because there was little mixed information, where to go, whether they should go to the, if they were in the private sector, should they go to the, uh, you know, uh, a public sector for delivery. So what to do when the woman is, uh, uh, delivering. So there were little, lot of worries also, a lot of misinformation also, and we very quickly, as I said, work both with the public sector as well as private sector to give the correct information about contraceptives and other things. Then a uh, lot of my uh, team members from Japaigo were members of the state COVID response team, and uh, you know, they were part of, you know, teleconsultations panel, the, uh, the COVID-19 control and telemedicine group, which was created in Rajasthan. And as I said, the rapid response team was one which was the brain, or you could say the heart of the uh, programs which were managing uh, this particular pandemic. So I would just say that, you know, we also started saying we need to celebrate the Corona warriors on the forefront. And as you know, there were a lot of good work which was being done by the grassroots level workers, whether it was our ASHA, whether it was an a &A, whether it was the community health officers, and we started coming out with these stories to share with, and one recognizing it also these uh, uh, the warriors who were working despite very you know difficult times, and also thanking them that they were the ones who were actually there on the grassroots doing the hard work. Uh, I'll just say thank you very much, and then I think th this is a picture which was sent by one of my colleagues where you can see the two kids. They were you know trying to pretend that they were traveling in an airplane and they are on a vacation and then how they are maintaining the social distancing. So since simple things which were coming up was something which we uh, were using to, uh, you know, educate the general masses and also our workers. Thank you very much. I'll stop. Thanks, thanks Dr. Sooth, for illustrious uh, response. In fact, we'll come back to you on certain elements which you showcased in the presentation uh, in the subsequent session. Uh, so uh, next, I'll ask Manoj, you know, uh, how care responded in, you know, COVID-19 situation. If you can share with you case studies, it would be really helpful to understand that. Manoj. Sure. Thanks, Vikas, for having me on this webinar. Good afternoon to the 300 plus participants who are on this webinar at this moment. So in fact, uh, I will just give you a little description on what care does and then talk about the response. CARE, as many of you will be knowing, is a global humanitarian assistance confederation operating in 90 countries. And we started actually our operation post the World War II. So much of the CARE's DNA is around relief and disaster support. So in fact, uh, in India, CARE has been working for the last seven decades. And we have, besides the disaster management, a strong portfolio of programs in health, livelihoods and education. So when the COVID situation was really coming critical during the February, March timeframe, so we were actually seeing this unfolding as a multi-dimensional crisis. So we have a health crisis, we have a livelihood crisis and a larger socioeconomic crisis embedded in it. So in fact, CARE decided to really leverage its capabilities in health and livelihoods programming, as well the decade long work in the disaster response to build a COVID response. So the COVID response for care, which we conceptualized in early March, is centered around three pillars. The first is basically the work that we do in Bihar, where we are supporting the government of Bihar. So the work is more around supporting the state government with our entire staff of 1,400 plus people working alongside WHO and UNICEF. So we, in fact, started supporting the state in terms of legislating the Epidemic Control Act. And then that was followed up with a whole lot of 
support in terms of contact tracing and developing containment strategies. And so we have very close partnerships going on with the government of Bihar in terms of strengthening their COVID response in the entire state. So the second pillar of our work is very focused on the migrants and the urban poor. In fact, one of the most visible phases of this crisis is the migrants and the challenges they face in many parts of the country. So what we have done is that we looked at people who don't have access to formal ration cards and access to PDS systems, and we wanted to really map those people and then provide them the beneficiary support in terms of the privation kit. So this is one program which we have rolled out in multiple uh, cities of the country. And as we are speaking, the program is at least at a decent level of scale in Pune, Mumbai, Delhi, Chennai. And we are also now rolling out further support in states like Telangana. So again, the focus has been fully on people who don't have access to formal public distribution system and how do you really reach them the immediate relief privation support. And the third pillar that we are going to focus on is very centered around the livelihoods of the rural communities. So we actually work in 14 states of the country and in all those states, our focus has been on the most marginalized and the poor communities. So their actually livelihoods have been impacted. The frontline health workers who reach out to them don't have access to many of the personal protective equipment needed for sustaining the field work. So in those programs, we started supporting the frontline health workers with personal protective equipment and also provide the support to the local communities in terms of strengthening their livelihood. And currently we have a program being rolled out with the mint growing farmers in the Lucknow region. And similarly, we have programs going on with the cotton farmers in Maharashtra and then Again, in Tamil Nadu and many other rural communities, we are actually starting to work very closely in terms of value chain restoration and in terms of the livelihood building. And all this actually, we have to do it in a lockdown environment, which is also one of the most critical challenges. So in Bihar, care has been declared as an essential services by the government, so which enables us to really roll out the services in close partnership with the government functionaries. Whereas in other states, we work a lot with local grassroots level NGO partners. So where we collaborate with them and the district administration to ensure that we reach out the benefits to the most marginalized populations. And I'm sure as we are really going into the second phase of the COVID response, we will see much more recovery related activities where you look at value chain restorations and livelihood strengthening in a much more you know, scalable and sustainable fashion. So I'll just pause here, and then we can really look at in the next stage if further we need to deep dive into any of these areas. Yeah, sure. Thanks, thanks, Manoj. I think it was pretty crisp and illustrious, both uh, in a way and uh, with a pretty live uh, case study. So I'll ask uh, you, Dr. Sood, about the, uh, you know, the technology leverage. See, in current timing, if we see, you know, each one of us uh, are in some way or the other affected by or impacted by technology. I think we have been working from home for past some time. I think the the way we are team meeting today also is, you know, uh, an output of that uh, perspective only. So you did mention in your presentation about the leverage of technology uh, and innovation, which you sort of uh, uh, made sure that the uh, the programs implemented by Japaigo are leveraging technology. So can you uh, share in a little more detail about those elements? And by the time Asif joins back, we can come back to you know the questions we were asking uh, yeah, earlier. Yeah, please, Dr. Sun. Thank you. So because as I was saying that uh, since uh, it was a lockdown and we had to work from home, and the big issue which was coming was how do you educate uh, the workers how do you educate uh, communities? How do you educate, uh, you know, your, uh, even the policy makers and others? So when we started working, we realized that, uh, uh, and we, I think we have been talking about using these platforms earlier also, but I think this uh, kind of gave us an opportunity and said, hey, you have to use it and you have to start working to ensure that how you become stronger in this. 
So we started uh, with uh, training people on uh, using the Eco platform and as a Zoom platform, like today we are connected. And we found that one, the, and we've been evaluating also how the, these trainings are going on. So we found very quickly we could train a large number of people without compromising on the quality, without compromising on, on you know, the interactive uh, uh, question answering that goes on with, uh, you know, uh, the typical training. Uh, we could also teach skills also because we've realized that now you have very good simulators and you can, for example, demonstrate a lot of things also. And uh, so we have found that uh, this is moving very well public sector as well as private sector and also at the grassroots level. The other thing which is happening is that you find that uh, whether it's the ASHAs or the ANMs and other uh, community-based workers, they are also becoming very savvy with the technology. We, we had a block that you know, these things, uh, you know, people will take time to understand. But today I find that each one is using it very successfully. So they are using their uh, uh, mobile phones that uh, very efficiently to link up. We are saving time, you know, because otherwise sometimes for a half a day training, you would find that people travel in the morning and, you know, they had to move from their place of work. Now you can do much more. So efficiency has also increased. I would say the quality of training has gone up, the efficiency has gone up. So technology in that sense has, and as I said, we have been also using to do the mentoring not just one-time training, but mentoring also. The other thing which we are finding that technology in terms of innovation that going forward is use of a lot of apps which have come up. So even the one which is used by the government, the Arud Situ, I, I find that it is useful because you know you can put your data and then you can see where you are, what is your status, and uh, you know how in the one uh, mile radius, how many kilometer radius, what are, what are the COVID cases? So similarly, the data is now being so we are collecting real time data for other things in the and we are working very closely, as I said, with the state government. So whether it's the migratory population which comes in and then you can follow it up and who's the one and what what containment you have to do or how you do the uh, data is. It's a real-time data and you can analyze the data and then you take actions also based on what you have found. Uh, the, the other thing which is starting is the telemedicine. Now, earlier we all, all felt that, you know, you have to go personally and see. Now, the telemedicine is becoming a big thing and Hub and Spoke model is being used by the, the government and the, the, the guidelines have been developed. So, we've been talking about telemedicine for a long time, but now there are guidelines, what to do, what not, how you can connect and again taking care of the safety and other things is, is coming up. So I see that in the, the coming um, months and years, some of these things which were kind of lying, uh, they were there but we were not using it enough is, is going to be now being taken up very uh, you know, efficiently and effectively and at a large scale. So we, we uh, going forward, I feel that it's going to change the way we were conducting training, the way we were uh, getting data and uh, analyzing the data. And it's going to be uh, very, very useful uh, in going years. I'll so, stop. So thanks, thanks, Dr. Sue. So by the time we are getting Asif back uh, on the panel, Manoj, if you can add on something because See, in your previous avatar also, you have curated, supported many health tech uh, organizations. So how critical you feel going forward, uh, technology leverage would be something which I think each uh, not-for-profit organization, whether it's a grassroots or a small, mid-size, have to sort of, you know, uh, evolve and marry with the, to make sure that the effective implementation of the program uh, is there. So any, any uh, you know, inputs on that side, please? Thanks, because in fact, in the care world, we were actually working on the care 2030 strategy when the COVID really hit us. So actually, one of the core pieces of what we were trying to do was move significantly onto the digitization piece. Because today, if you really see the kind of digital technologies that are possible and the one which is deployed. So in fact, care had one experience with the common application software 
which we have developed long back along with ICDS department. And this is something which really enabled a lot of ICDS workers and their supervisors to really monitor outreach and improve quality. So we started this work in Bihar and then it got scaled up to almost like uh, all states of the country. And so what happened is enabled ministry to conduct using YouTube and Zoom training sessions for all the ICDS workers. So we again did some initial pilots in Bihar and then we worked closely with the ministry and then finally the minister hosted the whole training session right up to the last mile ICDS worker, Anganwadi worker on the COVID response. So we really see that in the new world that we will all get into, contact is going to be a critical challenge. So that you need to really find ways to reach out to people in the least contact manner or the physical distancing be maintained. So for that, actually technology will play a very important role. And that's something which we realized. And we have brought that into the COVID response as well into the overall organization's digitization strategy. So I will pause because now we have Asif back. Yeah, ironically, uh, yeah. Asif, <laughs> we were talking about technology and we lost you in between. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, <laughs> is, that, that was quite, uh, quite uh, insane. Yeah, anyways, yeah. I'm so sorry about that. But no, no, anyways, no, no, that's no. what happens. Yeah, yeah. So I was just, you know, as uh, Dr. Sood and Manoj mentioned about response of their individual organization. So yeah. I would request you to also highlight that. And of course, along with that, if you can also uh, talk about the parameters of the data points which made those deciding factors happen, yeah. uh, it would be good to know. So sure. please, Sasha. Sure. Yeah. sure. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, no, thanks, uh, no, Vikas and uh, all the team members of, of GT for organizing this uh, uh, webinar, you know, extremely useful. I'm sure, you know, colleagues who have joined this would find it uh, purposeful, as uh, you know, many of us in Plan uh, do. And just to, you know, to, to kind of share about Plan India for those colleagues uh, on the webinar who may not be, you know, so familiar. Uh, Plan has uh, been working in India since 1979. We are. Uh, uh, a, a social development organization with a very strong focus on uh, promoting uh, you know, child rights, child development with a you know, element of gender equality. So we are working in uh, more than you know, 15 districts uh, as of now, so quite a, a wide reach of, of development programming around education, health, livelihoods, uh, uh, child protection, uh, you know, gender-based uh, you know, preventing gender-based violence, uh, you know, girls' education, so a range of things uh, which we have been doing. Coming specifically to the COVID-19 response, uh, we started uh, you know, much earlier, uh, sometime around February, and being part of a global uh, organization of plan working in more than uh, 70 countries. So there was much interaction that happened uh, once the the, the pandemic uh, uh, situation started to uh, to worsen in many countries and and also in India. So for us, our first uh, you know, take was that uh, you know, what 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 role? How do we you know, see our relevance in the emerging uh, you know, context or the things that are happening? So accordingly, what we did was we tried to look at, and as uh, my colleagues uh, Bulbul and uh, Manoj has all shared, uh, on very similar lines uh, within the Plan India team also, we started uh, looking at what are the things we can do. And, and we narrowed down to uh, you know, striking our relevance within uh, no, uh, no, a, a, a response uh, to the COVID-19 uh, situation, looking at uh, both a humanitarian as well as a development lens. So it was like a nexus approach to uh, to uh, to humanitarian uh, work, and accordingly we uh, with a very strong emphasis on public health. So we have over the last uh, eight weeks, the team of Plan India, and uh, since we also work with a number of, of uh, grassroots NGOs as our partners, because that has been our model of, of, uh, of work uh, or delivering social good on the ground. Uh, so Plan and our partners, what we did was we very quickly, uh, you know, in consultation with uh, district uh, administrations, came up with uh, no, what are the, the the needs of people on the ground? And accordingly, we narrowed down to uh, four critical needs. 
Uh, so first, I, I think all of us are well aware is about uh, um, no, making available uh, no, food aid to vulnerable families. Uh, so uh, no, making food aid available. Second was on uh, no, no, ensuring that people have soaps, uh, no, sanitizers and other, uh, no, especially particularly girls and women have the, the necessary hygiene uh, protection, the menstrual hygiene management uh, no, uh, no, things which uh, they can use. So uh, hygiene kits and uh, also as uh, my colleague uh, no, Bulbul also mentioned, uh, no, spreading awareness on COVID because large parts of, of the country where we are uh, working on the you know, at the grassroots level in the villages, people are not so aware and familiar with uh, yeah, with what uh, this uh, disease and and uh, what are the protection uh, you know, steps that people can take. So spreading awareness and uh, because uh, we are working in an ecosystem where uh, frontline health workers and being a, a pandemic, uh, no, which has a strong, you know, which a very clear uh, health uh, impact. Uh, so we were uh, very keen that uh, the frontline health workers are protected and we could try to see what role we can play in terms of, of uh, providing assistance and support along with what the district administrations has been doing. So in the last uh, eight weeks, uh, about uh, uh, no, we have uh, no, uh, no, in more than sixty districts because our footprint is a is a currently in about five thousand villages and urban slums. Uh, so in about uh, no, sixty districts, we have uh, working closely with the district administration, the block administration. We have been able to support uh, about uh, fifty thousand families with. Uh, no food basket so that uh, it can take uh, them through the, the challenging time, particularly vulnerable families. Uh, so making food uh, uh, no, available, which would take uh, about uh, 30 days of dry rations, uh, hygiene kits to nearly 55,000 families, uh, about uh, 20,000 plus uh, no, frontline health workers, ANMs, ashras have been supported with PPE kits. And uh, in more than 2,200 uh, villages and urban slums, we have been able to spread awareness both through, uh, through you know, online uh, you know, modes as well as uh, uh, calling up uh, you know, people and, and informing families uh, with whom we have been in contact, uh, you know, trying to advising them as to how uh, they can uh, keep themselves safe and protected. Uh, and also particularly looking at uh, addressing stigma and discrimination. At another level, there were some projects which we have been doing. Uh, one, we have we are a development partner with Niti Aayog in seven aspirational districts, uh, particularly to improve health and nutrition outcomes. So we were very closely uh, working with uh, uh, the, the district administration in these seven districts to see how we can uh, you know, support the districts in terms of, of uh, improving their quality and uh, of work. And in many districts, because district administration has started community kitchens, so we were there supporting uh, the district administration in, uh, in managing and, and uh, addressing, especially on the data, uh, you know, collecting data, information, to figure out uh, what more needs to be done in the district in so far as addressing uh, food security uh, for vulnerable population, migrant population who are coming back into the district. So those kind of, of data processes we have done. Also addressing issues around uh, uh, no, no other needs uh, that the district has and, and doing uh, data analysis and providing the district with information so that they can then accordingly plan ahead. Uh, no, in one of our uh, projects where we are working in 357 districts and which is very much targeted to uh, you know, persons with HIV, uh, we were also work, you know, closely working with NACO and the, the, the frontline uh, government health delivery system to ensure that uh, uh, antiretroviral drugs are, uh, you know, are home delivered to uh, people who know, need it across these districts and, and a large number of people who were on ARVs and who were registered with the government system and who couldn't uh, make the, the, the trek to the, 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 uh, the hospital, uh, ICTC centers uh, or ARV centers for their dr drugs, uh, those uh, no, uh, no support was provided at home. So these were some of the things we did. Uh, we did. And as uh, you know, on your last point, uh, on your question around uh, data, because much of these has to be very, very targeted because we are working in, in very you know, no, uh, constrained you know, systems. We didn't want to in, you know, have more people on the ground than is necessary 
necessary, ensure social distancing. So data and, and working on data for the frontline teams, for the state teams was extremely critical so that we were out in the community or in the in in the field delivering the the things that people needed uh, no with uh, no as uh, no less and as uh, no uh, as as little uh, with very little uh, kind of uh, no uh, 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 ex uh, 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 people on the ground so so data definitely has been a very important point and we have been working on on doing data analysis crunching uh, no, working with the, the district administration to see what how do we uh, make uh, ourselves relevant and how uh, the resources that are are available are uh, put to best use so that's been the current uh, focus i'll come back with more details as we progress in the conversation thank you uh, thanks thanks Asif, and thanks for the latest uh, response uh, so, you know, so far our discussion largely happened on how we responded to the situation. So, you know, the next set I would like to each uh, ask each one of you on progressively how things should unfold, you know, from here onwards. So, Manoj, if I can come to you, I mean, during the uh, discussion, you mentioned that you were working on 2030 strategy when COVID happened. So, how do you foresee, you know, in the circumstances where, you know, of course, care was at that stage, to the, uh, how the program strategy, priorities, trends, opportunities, foresee would undergo a change in the next, you know, uh, mid to uh, near future, you know, which is one to two years to three years. So, and specifically, I mean, you can talk about care or you can talk about in general, how the CSOs would sort of, you know, uh, have to change gears accordingly, please. See, you know, one of the key things that we have looked at when we looked at uh, this CARE 2030 strategy, we are now trying to do a refresh in the context of COVID. But we found that you don't need too much of change, but it needs basically a bit of strong prioritization. And where the prioritization needs to come in, one is to have population health surveillance technologies. So that you need to really monitor what kind of epidemics are coming and how they are growing so that you can really respond faster. So that we will have a lot of focus going forward around population health surveillance technologies for health system strengthening, especially we all are following the WHO principles for strengthening the primary health care. And again, bringing that element of population health surveillance and ensuring that epidemics are tracked and responded on time <coughs> is going to be one key element of how the things will evolve for the future. Second is basically around the livelihoods. So we need to really look at restoring the livelihoods for the most marginalized population by ensuring that they have access to credit, they have access to income generating activities, they have certain elements of value chain restoration that happens. So a lot of more work I see going forward is going to be centered around these two pillars besides whatever we do in the larger humanitarian response context. So I don't see a kind of a strategic shift by virtue of COVID, but a lot of refocus around community health programming and a lot of focus around livelihood strengthening is going to happen in the next two to three years in our program outlook. Yeah. And also do you foresee because all these strategic elements will have a lot of assumptions around it. Yeah. And uh, I think in the current scenario, our assumptions would also unfold as the situation unfolds. So how important do you foresee that part uh, to also make, to make sure that strategy still remains pertinent as it moves? Oh. So you know, that's one of the core elements that we are looking at because today we don't know whether we are at the beginning of the epidemic or mid of the pandemic or at the end of it. So that the situation will unfold and we need to be really focused around addressing the things in a way that the way epidemic is really progressing, we are also correcting and course correcting the strategic outlook and the program outlook that we are really going to have. But in my personal opinion, much of that will be taking shape in terms of the delivery part, the how part of it. But the what and what part of it, I don't think is not going to change significantly. We have to strengthen community-based health delivery program. And then we also have to look at the storing and strengthening the livelihood of the most marginalized population, because we know that by virtue of COVID, the poverty situation in the country is going to become much more acute. So that we need to have much more intensive and scalable programs 
happening on ground. And then other larger thing that will be of an implication to organizations like CARE is that we need to have a lot more partners on ground because it's very clear that COVID is not a kind of a challenge which can be really managed by a few organizations. We need to have a solid ecosystem responses by getting more and more civil society partners and larger organizations to work together along with the government response to see that we have something sustainable in place. Yeah, I think that's very insightful, Manoj. Uh, thanks for that. Uh, and Dr. Sudha, I'll come to you. Uh, from Chapaigo perspective, how do you foresee uh, the strategy or you know uh, the programs are to go change or the reprioritization of certain activities which you are doing right now? So how do you foresee the near future in terms of those trends and opportunities for Chapaigo and for the civil society organization as a well? whole? So I agree with what Manoj said that, you know, the way we are, uh, the strategies will kind of remain the same, but the focus will have to change. So what I see one definitely is, besides what uh, Varun said, is that we have to invest in public health. You know, public health has been a neglected area uh, in our country, and I think it's there in other countries also. But we need to really build a strong public health uh, system in the country and also have the expertise and the expertise has to be down at the primary healthcare level not only at the tertiary or at the state levels we need to have so like and once we start using now the way that we are collecting data you know so that real time data collection analysis use of data to make you know uh, you know uh, take decision or make a mid course correction would be the thing that we'll have to look at the other thing we need to also look at is that uh, integrated disease surveillance. You know that going forward, see, we, we today have COVID, but you know, we had other earlier in last uh, I would say 10, 15 years. A lot of you know different viruses are coming up, so we keep hearing. But we need to have a, a a command team kind of a group which will look at all these, and they are all interrelated. So we'll have to really look at how we you know bring these together and. And the third would be very important is working, what we talk about the intersectoral coordination. So working in silos will not, uh, you know, uh, be uh, of great use to us and to us in the sense of the system. So when we're talking about the systems approach, we'll have to bring in all other related sectors very uh, closely and we have to work. And I think one example, and I feel that the, the in this COVID situation, a lot of things from the health point of view, people were taking the decision based on the, the situation which happened and which nobody, you know, I guess there was planning, but I think we missed somewhere. And uh, so in, we have to come up with solutions which are uh, much more, uh, I would say, interconnected. And uh, Moving forward, I see, uh, as Manu said, we have to work with all the other sectors together. We can't have, you know, health working on silo uh, and environment working in different silo and, you know, your uh, livelihood working or the small city working. We have to bring a lot of partners together, but strengthen the primary health care. I think this is a time that uh, the, uh, the I would say it would be very good if there's not just the state government, but the the, uh, the CSOs, the other private sector uh, players, they invest more in strengthening the uh, the primary health care in the country. And we have an advantage that now with uh, the health and wellness centers which are being set up, and as uh, the, the plan is that by 2022, we should have almost 150,000 health and wellness centers across the country. So uh, we, we, we have an opportunity and we can build on that. And uh, so, but but I would say also, let's not forget, you know, we, we, we have, you know, we've been working on COVID and other infectious diseases, but the gains which have been made in the area of maternal and child health, in the area of family planning, in the area of, uh, you know, our uh, TB, malaria, that we should not forget, because we should not be just focusing on one disease and forgetting the others which uh, can be deadlier, and then the numbers who die because of those are much larger than what we are seeing people dying of COVID. So we need to take a holistic view of what's happening. 
Uh, thanks, Dr. Sur. I think that's a pretty uh, insightful approach and the collaboration that has to go on the various you know, thematic areas also. So, uh, Asim, I'll come to you uh, as you know, uh, Dr. Sur mentioned and Manoj also emphasized on the partnership. You have been a program administrator right from you know, uh, beginning and curated many uh, you know, programs. So, how do you foresee, you know, and plan is known for working with, you know, lot many implementing agencies. How do you foresee uh, in the proposed, you know, uh, time of change of strategy, uh, the contribution from implementing agencies as well as, uh, you know, any ch other change you foresee in terms of technology side or other, which would undergo a priority change or take a more leading role uh, from a strategy perspective from program implementation in the near future? Uh, thanks, Rikas, for asking this question, because this is very important. And I think uh, there has been much discussion and, and people have been uh, trying to reflect on you know, the, how, thing, how lives are going to change, how things are going to change uh, post-COVID. Though we have still not seen the end of the, or light at the end of the tunnel, we are still in the process. But uh, there are enough trends and indications which suggest that uh, no, no, it will it will be a new normal. So it's not going to be the no, business as usual. Things are going to change. Uh, they were already changing as we you know, came into 2020, but uh, COVID has accelerated or brought about a completely different uh, uh, level. And in some cases, it's literally you know, no, press the reset button. Uh, and, and and that's very critical, especially from uh, no, for a CSO uh, from a CSO's lens. No, wh what are the changes that we are anticipating and which we are seeing? The first one is that the ecosystem, the, the ecosystem, and what uh, uh, Bulbul and Manoj did allude to, that it won't just be a uni kind of a thematic working. It will have to be a multi-sectoral approach where uh, public health uh, you know, will be a very integral part. You know, if, even if when we are working in school, you'll have to have an understanding of how public health uh, you know, uh, intersects uh, with the, the, the business of, of uh, you know, delivering uh, quality education. Or if you're looking at livelihoods, scaling, uh, how, where, how, where does public health come in? So public health, uh, you know, livelihoods, education, so th there would be a lot of, of intersectionality that's going to come up and uh, it cannot be wished away. That, that's how uh, life will be and that's what the ecosystem will be. Uh, because uh, the, the other important uh, you know, transformation would be, in, especially for you know, CSOs, would be their own internal delivery models. The delivery models will be you no know, will definitely be changed. It can't be that we get fifty people, five hundred people together and and do a training program. That's not going to happen, uh, especially for the for for some time now. We will have to come up with new models in which you you know impart training, capacity building, uh, awareness generation on critical issues, uh, and that, that's where technology becomes a very critical and a good enabler. But again, technology also has its limitations because we all know that while technology it can be a great enabler, uh, it can also exclude the people whom we really want to, uh, to achieve because they may not have access uh, to the technology. So you may have to first uh, you know, create the inclusion. The digital inclusions have to be worked first before uh, we, we, we start riding on technology. So our own internal mechanisms will and operating models will have to uh, be rethought. And that's what many organizations are doing, including uh, us in Plan India. At the third level, and I think that's again very critical, is the donor mind, the donor landscape, the donor expectations from civil society is going to 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 you no know, transform. The donor will have very different understanding of what uh, no, uh, no, they want uh, or they expect from civil society organizations, and which has an implication for the type of funding available to the sector. So that again uh, will 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 uh, will, will uh, no, do a uh, no, will. Have, that there will be change out there. We don't know yet exactly, though the current indications are that there will be lesser uh, funding. And that's what uh, most uh, people, because uh, government and corporates, uh, because of the economic downturn, they themselves are feeling a lot of uh, no, heat uh, at their level. So the availability of funds will, will shrink, at least for the, for the coming um, no, few years, which essentially means that uh, we may have to re-strategize. Uh, no, we may have to think of doing uh, more with less 
and and those are 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 ways and for build driving greater cost efficiencies than what we actually and what we are currently working with and finally i think the point which uh, manoj and bulbul also alluded to and i think it's a very important thing what covid has done and that is the silver lining uh, from covid is that it will drive greater collaborative work and we are already seeing it government civil society corporates they are all working together to defeat uh, the virus and i think that sentiment that culture which is a new culture of collaboration culture of partnership uh, that uh, in my opinion is going to to further deepen further strengthen and uh, that is one thing which is very critical especially with the uh, with our honorable prime minister talking about self reliant in uh, reliance uh, and self reliant india mission uh, i think uh, you know the whole collaboration paradigm uh, which is uh, going to kind of uh, you know get and, and take more shape as we progress uh, into the pandemic i think uh, that is uh, no uh, no a very important thing and within that uh, inclusion of girls and women we all are well aware that no nearly uh, no our workforce participation the women's workforce participation in our country is very very low compared to many other countries in the world particularly in the developed uh, space now this is the time for us to really work hard work together to see how we can improve women's workforce participation so that we are able to not just uh, no uh, no uh, uh, fight our way through this uh, this pandemic uh, or work our way through this pandemic but also in the process come up as winners by including a large section of our population into the economic mainstream into the uh, the, the, the the national development efforts and uh, you know, emerge as winners in the coming few years thank you Mm, thanks, Asif, for pretty astute and precise pointers, uh, especially on the collaboration and partnership. So, thanks uh, for that. So, as we you know, uh, we construed this uh, session. We thought we'll keep uh, you know few minutes for question answers. So, I've got a couple of them before Abhishek can ask. So, uh, Manoj, I know that you have some time commitment, so I'll come to you for this. So, as Asif also highlighted, that uh, funding, especially from the you know CSR perspective. Uh, there is a big question how it unfolds, and this is uh, you know a question which we had from other uh, panelists, uh, other participants also that in current you know CSR commitments being diverted to PM Cares, how do you foresee you know uh, that impact would be on the sector in you know near future a year or so? What's your uh, so far you know uh, take uh, while speaking to your CSR donors or uh, your experience so far dealing with them? So you know our own experience related to the fundraising environment is that definitely I agree that the environment is going to be challenging and there will be a lot more demand for the limited amount of you know investments available for various social programs. But on the other side, what I really see is that most of the large institutional donors, whether it is USAID or Gates Foundation or even some of the large corporate donors, especially the global corporations. I think many of them have really put sizable amount of investments available for the COVID response. So I think though we can anticipate some amount of challenges from individual fundraising, especially when individuals do contribute. So that's the segment which may get a bit of you know, challenge. But on the corporate fundraising and institutional fundraising, as per the current signals, there are a lot more commitments available for us to really mount a good response to the next at least one to two year time horizons. So that's pretty encouraging, uh, you know, to know that uh, many big corporates and institutional donors are still staying committed uh, for the near future. So uh, thanks for that, Manoj. And, uh, you know, I would come to talk to those, you know, some question uh, more in terms of, you know, collaboration we talk about quite a bit uh, in uh, both uh, Donor fraternity, as well as you know, in in uh, CSO fraternity. So somebody asked that: Is there a possibility of having collaboration within NGOs, and especially since you know the ones which are matured, like uh, organization like yours, to curate and run programs in such scenario wherein commitment for running individually are not either being fulfilled, uh, even with the commitments being there. So, is there a possibility of collaboration, you know, within NGOs? I'll say for similar projects. And if yes, 
uh, I mean, it'd be good to know, you know, how are possible field samples. So, Dr. Sudha, I'll request you and, you know, after that, uh, Manoj, Asif, anyone of you also can add on to that. So, uh, because I would say that definitely there is a, you know, we can collaborate. You know, so there is, if, for example, if we take, and I'm just giving an example, hypothetical, that if you take a district as a unit, or you take a block as a unit, you can, uh, you, you, if you just do the, uh, say, okay, which are the NGOs which are working in different areas. So there would be some NGOs which are working in health, there are some work, uh, who would be working on the, uh, education, there would be some working on uh, in, uh, rural development. So there would be different. And sometimes if you actually start tracking, you'll find that there are a lot of duplications going on. Now, if we can just take that as unit and say, okay, how you can connect all the dots and come up with a comprehensive, you know, uh, collaborative programming and then manage it well. You know, I think what, what happens is sometimes you find that, and I always feel that if you add up the different category of workers which are there through, you know, different institutions, even the government institutions, you know, they add up a lot of people. But we, we don't, you know, uh, use them in a way where it becomes a strength. Uh, and everybody is kind of working in their own, uh, you know, sphere and kind of sometimes also duplicating things. So if we can come up with a flow, I, I would say this is a time to really sit down and see, okay, who is doing what? How do we, you know, um, define this is your primary role, this is your secondary role, how do we link up and come up with, uh, a, you know, programs which will be stronger, but also taking uh, care that the communities have to be involved very strongly in this. I think it can't be a top down it has to be a bottom up so you have to involve the communities communities are very smart people are very smart take women groups take uh, whether the self help groups are there which are very strong you have uh, uh, you know other and if if you list again within the different programs there are so many groups which are there if we can uh, you know have them leading it bringing the changes and you know india today is Definitely aspirational. The young people are very aspirational. Let's take, you know, our young people into the confidence, sit down with them, develop a program which could be, you know, better managed by the people themselves. I think we can do a lot together. Sure, sure. Thanks. Thanks, Dr. So, any uh, input, uh, Manoj, uh, also if anybody can. Uh... No, I think most of the large donors also today respect a much more collaborative approach because they know that possibly the response to COVID can't be a unilateral response. It needs to be multidimensional and there are not uh, many organizations who possess all the skill sets. So that donors itself, even some of the large corporate donors are saying that, okay, you're good at health related work and somebody else is good at livelihood. Can you guys really work together? in this particular geography. So I see in the days to come, you will see many of the partners working together and also collaborating a lot more with on-ground community-based organizations and women self-help groups to really drive these programs into execution. Because COVID responses needs to be truly multidimensional and multi-sectoral, which needs a lot more partnerships to really come in. And that's the fundamental shift that I will see happening, which is for good, in the CSO world. Great. Yeah. yeah. Can, can I just, just, just share? I think collaboration is already happening. And, and I think, uh, no, and, and the good news is that, uh, no, uh, some of the collaboration has been kind of, uh, no, encouraged by uh, the government through its notification. And if, if you remember, as part of the COVID response, there was uh, this uh, no, notification that in every district, the district collectors were invited to set up mother NGOs who can then drive collaboration uh, with other NGOs in the district so that the, you know, there is pooling of, of resources. And, uh, no, and that, that's how uh, no, the district uh, development process is uh, on the COVID response and other challenges in the district are, are, are worked 
uh, no, together. So that, that, that that's uh, the level of, of uh, significance that collaboration has been put at the government as well as within the civil society. I just wanted to kind of add one point uh, because within plan, and this was pre-COVID, uh, no, eight, uh, eight uh, no, INGOs had come together to form uh, joining forces. And, and this was a, you know, a good example of collaborative working. And uh, now with COVID uh, emerging, there is, uh, you know, there is a need of deepening this. And already the, uh, the conversations are happening that how can we get more uh, you know, civil society participants and actors to, uh, to join this, uh, this you know, collaboration, this consortium, this alliance, so that uh, you know, much more of, of uh, you know, efficiencies uh, as uh, Bulbul earlier mentioned, uh, in terms of so that we prevent duplication, use the resources wisely, and uh, also mutual learning, because you don't need to reinvent the wheel. Because the greatest uh, advantage of collaboration is that if some, something has worked somewhere, uh, no, rather than reinvent the wheel, use it and 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 run with the with the ball. So I think that's uh, that's very important. Uh, one point, uh, no, responding to the point that Manoj uh, no, highlighted earlier, is that while the international donors and and the the, the institutional uh, donors would be uh, no are not going to pull back, and that's what the indication looks like at this point, uh, which uh, no is is okay, but uh, particularly bilaterals, multilaterals, and particularly multilaterals because a lot of global funding has gone to the UN system uh, because more, most people globally have uh, no, funded uh, UN and now the UN is uh, no, has a lot of resources uh, no, for the next few uh, years to, to tackle the COVID response. The, the challenge is that uh, no, quite often than not, uh, there are certain agendas or certain aspects of development programming that then be becomes fancied and many other issues which may be equally critical and which may have local significance. Let's take issues of, of ending domestic violence, gender-based violence, uh, things like that, which have uh, which are more local. They're not, not, not spread all across uh, the country. They may not get the type of financing and they may be equally important you know, preventing child marriages in certain communities which, which may, or child labor. So those kind of issues may not get the type of, of uh, no, funding uh, that they, they, they need to really you know, have a holistic appeal on and, and attraction uh, for change. Thanks. Thanks, thanks, Tase, for the candid, uh, you know, this uh, uh, sharing. So I think uh, we have lot many questions, but I think in the interest of time, we already, uh, you know, uh, overshot the time. So uh, what we'll do, we'll, uh, you know, uh, document those questions and share that with you. They are, you know, specifically highlighted for a particular panelists to respond and share back the responses uh, to the respective email IDs. So thanks a lot for all of you, uh, you know joining us, all the participants, and of course, our panelists sharing the views very candidly, illustriously, and of course, you know, a lot of new elements of collaboration across various verticals, you know, depending upon what technology leverage one can draw, and of course, the trust in partnership one can leverage. So good to hear that, and uh, I'm sure uh, it would be a good sharing with the entire CSO participant community and other stakeholders who participated for the today webinar. Uh, we'll keep on engaging you, uh, you know, as we go forward uh, in our thought leadership series for other webinars. So thanks a lot. Thank you very much. And it was a pleasure to have all of you here as a panelist. Thanks.